two, one. And welcome everybody to another edition of the Property Manager Mastermind Show. I'm your host, Brad Larson. And today's guest, I am very, very excited to announce Mike Nelson is on the line with me on a Zoom call. And we're going to be doing a podcast talking about the add-on seminar number one, the add-on seminar to the Property Manager Mastermind Conference going on Monday, 2nd of March, 2020, Las Vegas in the Mirage. And Mike is going to be giving us a, a fantastic class. It's a three-hour block of instruction talking about key performance indicators. And so I'm glad to have Mike on the line with me. Mike, how are you today? Give us a few minutes. I'm great, Brad. How are you doing? I'm awesome. Thanks. So, so let's get some intro stuff because I want to hear, I mean, we, we got to answer the first question, right? And we were talking about this pre-show. Why does anybody want to listen to Mike? Well, we know no one wants to listen to me. So I'm hoping somebody out there wants to listen to you. So if we answer that question, uh, I want to give you the floor so you can give us some background of your property management experience. And then also come, let's talk about what you've done in the KPI world, the cash flow analysis world. And so you don't have to brag about what you're doing, but darn it, we'd love to hear more about, you know, how you're able to get the background to be able to put on this. And I, I approached you, if you remember, I approached you and begged you to do this ad on seminar. So give us a few minutes and tell us about your background here. Okay. Well, um, all those people that have trouble sleeping at night can listen to the bio stuff, but I've been licensed since 77, been you know, a broker since 81 and had my own business going since 1985. So in short, I've been doing this for a really long time. I've uh, been involved with NARPM for over 20 years and have all the designations for a property manager, including the MPM and the, the company has a CRMC. But where this is really uh, applicable is we started out, uh, I started out in a one room office with a handful of units and grew it over time. But it's back in 2003 that I really started to approach it as a business and started measuring performance. And back then I was only measuring about six different things. And today you'll see later uh, in, the <clears throat> in the class that my templates are covering about 30 different metrics in one, in one fashion or another. Uh, we're a lot bigger now. It used to be a handful of units. As of October 31, it's 1,941 units and still growing pretty rapidly. And I attribute a lot of the growth to we develop a plan, we implement the plan, we track how we're doing with the plan. When we're not exactly hitting our numbers, we can use those same metrics to figure out how to go around the obstacle if we can't go over or through. Uh, so we know where we want to be. Great intro. What we're trying to do here is answer the question, what do I do with key performance indicators? How do I work with those? Because you and I saw this a bunch on the boards. Hey, does anybody have a list of key performance indicators that we can use? And then, okay, you throw it out there and they don't, they don't really know how to necessarily tie that into the NARPA accounting standards, which we're going to touch on. And also putting that into real world practice. So this is where you and I devise this seminar to say, okay, we're going to allow Mike the floor for three hours to give him an add on seminar to be able to teach the key performance indicators method, because these are the numbers inside of the numbers, right? And that's what people have to understand. And each business is going to have their own. I mean, I'm talking each individual office company brokerage, you're going to have their own key performance indicators. They're not, it's not a one size fits all, but if we can give you some sort of perimeters and guideline to fit into the NARPM accounting standard, it makes your life a whole lot easier. So if we're actually comparing them, uh, side by side, they make a lot of sense. Now we have our own little secret squirrel key performance indicators as everybody else does, but this is part of why we're doing this. And so, you know, just kind of give us a little bit of background of as far as what you think kind of the class will be like teaching those key performance indicators uh, in the NARPM accounting standards inside of that for the add-on seminar at the Property Manager Mastermind Conference. Go, kind of go from there. Okay. Well, the class is going to start out with the broad, the basic, in other words, what every company ought to be measuring regarding uh, debt, net income, what your margins are, those sorts of things, tracking how your gross progresses over time, how your net progresses over time, uh, and several other things that any business ought to be tracking. But then we get down into the property management specific parts of what we're tracking. For instance, uh, how your leasing is doing, how your property managers are performing, and this is where Excalibur's uh, metrics have evolved is as we grew, as we added more staff, one of the things that we looked at is um, most of the employees are not entrepreneurs. They want a base, but at the same time, they want to be recognized for when they do a good job. So when we measure how well we're doing regarding work orders, we measure how well we're doing regarding renewals, 
then we can reward people because we know what normal is and we know what excellent looks like. So when we see excellent, there's the numbers, here's your bonus. And we found a really uh, good correlation between their effort, the amount of time they want to stay with the company and their ability to have a base they can count on, but also have a carrot when they do well. Uh, Incentivizing so. your staff is absolutely key. This is a big reason why you want to keep key performance indicators is for one to measure how you're doing things in your business, but also two to give people that what I call a warm blanket of continuity to where they know that if I hit a certain number, I get a certain bonus and it makes me feel good about it because you can, you can goal people for the year. I mean, here we are coming up on 2020. Now it's time to start talking about setting your goals for 2020. And how do you do some of this? Developing those key performance indicators, those KPIs to put them onto your team and onto your business. Now, I want you to talk a little bit about the cash flow analysis that you used to teach or still teach with NARPM because this, this justifies kind of where you're coming from as a financial instructor. So please go from there. Well, one of the parts of the bio is that I've been a teacher of property management for a long time, both here in Georgia, and I'm also one of the NARPM national instructors. And NARPM has a class, as you know, cash flow analysis, which I wrote. Uh, and the idea there is to make sure that you understand. In other words, if you were out uh, shopping for a retirement account to put your money into, and you were looking at the uh, brochures that those uh, funds would send to you, you're probably going to be influenced by what were their one-year, five-year, and 10-year yields, and they're going to influence which uh, fund you're going to invest in. Well, in the same way, if you're an investor going to buy a rental house, if you're looking at a 10% internal rate return or a 12% internal rate return, you're going to choose the 12 but if you don't measure, you have no idea. They just look like two different houses. So the same cash flow analysis that an investor would use related to buying a rental property is the same cash flow and analysis that a, an investor would use regarding buying your business. So if you think about, there's a business book out there, there's thousands of them, but one of them called Built to Sell. Uh, however you want to look at it, one way or another, there's going to be an exit. You might you die, do you might have your business. kids take over, you might sell the business, but you kind of need to think in terms of how am I going to optimize the value of my business? And one of the ways that you do that is develop your KPIs and then track your KPIs and then maximize. I just want on the record that did you do that for a reason? Did you drop built to sell on purpose? Because you do no, realize it's just John a good Warlow, example. Just a good example. John Warlow, who wrote Built to Sell and has a podcast show, Built to Sell, is one of our marquee speakers at the Property Management Mastermind Conference. I don't know if you did that on purpose, Mike, but I'll give you a $5 bill on the side here just for doing that. No, it was actually, uh, for those of us that uh, want to make a few extra dollars each month, it's a good example of how you look at your business as a cash generator. And you think in terms of, it's not just a function of, I can reduce costs here. On the contrary, a lot of times you think about how I can increase costs here to reduce my time here. Uh, so there's a trade-off that's going on in all of these things that we do. But the bigger thing is, are you flying blind or not? I'll use the analogy uh, in the class and build on it when we have more time. Related to, uh, people use the term dashboards a lot. Well, think about a literal dashboard on an airplane. Uh, when you don't have little lights to turn yellow and turn red when you've got problems, all you know is all of a sudden it got really quiet. That's not an indicator that you really wanna come across. And if you had uh, gauges or dials you might be able to see a problem developing before the engine got really quiet and now you're in a glider. So in the same way, it happens with your business. If you're tracking things, you can, only, you can see how to maximize net income, but you can also see when problems are developing, when you have a debt issue, when you have a cash flow issue, when you are overstaffed, when you're understaffed. Uh, one of the little things that we look at is we know how many, uh, we use leasing agents because the clients that we serve like leasing agents and they hate the idea that somebody's going to go in their house uh, without an agent being present. So it's one of our unique selling propositions when we talk to clients. And one of the things that we've uh, figured out is that our agents can only lease about 15 houses a month if they do it a really good month. So when we get to the point where we got more than 15 listings per agent, I need more agents. And if I don't, I'm leaving money on the table because houses are going unrented because we don't have enough people to show them. So let's back up a little bit. I want to talk about the NARPM accounting standard and how this ties into the key performance indicator seminar class, because one thing that people have to understand is that you and I were on the committee together and we, we helped basically institute the NARPM accounting standards inside of NARPM. So 
you and I were on this committee. We went to NARPA and we asked for money. We got the money received and we went to a vendor and they built the chart of accounts and the rules and regulations that are, are guidelines, not, not rules necessarily, guidelines for the NARPA accounting standard. So then we're asking, you know, getting answered or asked the question how to answer it. How do you tie this into your key performance indicators into the NARPA accounting standard? Because, you know, honestly, if you're looking at them, they're two different sets of, of tracking mechanisms, but they do tie into each other at certain levels. And so having said all that, can you maybe give me some indications on how you feel the, the gap will be bridged there? Well, the NARPA accounting standards is not by themselves metrics. What they were is a standard, or what that is, is a standardization. One of the challenges we had before is NARPA was trying to poll our members and in a sense say, how much do you make from leasing fees and how much do you make from management fees and come up with some numbers so that you could show all the members, this is what average looks like. This is what normal looks like. And you can use these numbers and compare them to your own operation to see are you doing well or not so well. Well, the problem was the numbers were all over the place. You had members that were turning in numbers that their management income included brokerage sales because it was a managed property or maintenance income generated because it was a managed property and other people reporting different ways. So it's all over the place. So by having a standardized uh, chart of accounts, then what happens is the next time we're polling folks, we can just say, tell us what your 4,100 series of income is and what your 4,800 series of income is, what your 6,200 series of expenses are. And then from, from there, part of the same survey would say, uh, how many units are you managing? And we can turn that into, this is what normal or average looks like. And now you have a yardstick by which to measure your own performance. If the Across many spectrums, because it's not just your own, it's, it's yours versus mine. Correct. You said yours, and we can measure that and speak the same language. Exactly. That's the beautiful thing about that, as you start to, as more companies start to adopt that, we were an early adopter. We, we built it into the business right away. I think you guys may have done the same. And it really, I mean, it wasn't that hard of a deal. So maybe just for fun, because you're a pretty good numbers guy, we all know this. Uh, talk us through a real world implementing the NARPA accounting center, what it means to implement it. Because it's, it's, people think, oh my God, it's going to take $10 billion of money and a thousand hours. Talk us through kind of that because you probably did it in, in a couple of minutes, but let's hear some. Well, that's not a couple of minutes, but we already had a chart of accounts. We already had uh, years and years worth of data that we didn't want to give up. So uh, the easy way to do it is to start a new QuickBooks file and set up a brand new chart of accounts. And if you do that, well, it's simple. It's just the time consuming part of creating uh, 80 general ledger accounts. That's not any big deal. You can do that easily in three or four hours. We modified our existing chart of accounts. That took two to three weeks, but uh, it was just a question of a little at a time. We just redefined what the account number was, and in some cases created some additional account numbers to break it out. And one of the things that's already somewhat beneficial is before we had advertising, and now you've got advertising broken out is, what's advertising for getting homes to rent versus what's advertising for uh, new clients? So in a sense now, we have an easy way, which is the 6200 series of accounts. How much are we spending to promote our business to sign up new landlords? Which is different from how much are you spending to promote your business to get new buyers and sellers related to your sales business or how much are you doing related to your maintenance and operation? And now you can create metrics related to between, I pay this much for payroll and this much for advertising, it costs me this much for every new account. Now, if it costs me, I'm just using this as an example, if it costs me $500 to sign up a new account and somebody wants to sell me a book of business for $1,000, I got to think about if it's not a really big book of business, why would I pay twice as much when I can kind of just get them over time? But if you're trying to sell me a thousand accounts, then there's that acceleration of jumping to the next level, but you have these numbers. Otherwise you're just thinking, well, here's an opportunity to buy 80, 90, hundred accounts. Well, why would you pay twice what you're going to pay if you just bring them in one to two, five at a time? Yeah, the acquisitions mergers concept of this is a, is a whole nother separate podcast because it, this ties into that either you want to get positioned to where you want to be bought or you want to get positioned to where you want to start buying or, you know, you want to be just valued or, you know, something falls in your lap. That's one of the things like Matt Whitaker is going to be teaching at the, the uh, mastermind conference is what happens. You do, what do you do when an acquisition falls in your lap? Right. Because that's, that's a lot of what happens with us now. Well, you know, it helps to also evaluate. Um, whether it's a good enough deal for you or not, because 
when you look at your, this is back to the Norfolk accounting standards, one of the things you start measuring is the average life of an account so you can figure out what the average total income from an account is. And if you're a company that has a churn problem, you're signing up 30 units a month, but you're losing 30 units a month, then you're spending tons of money to stay in the same place. Uh, and that's not exactly very profitable. So one of the things that you're looking at is if, it, if my new account is only going to give me $2,000, how much can I afford to pay for a $2,000 account versus our average life of account is over seven years, close to eight years. And so the average life of an account is several thousands of dollars. And so it has more value if it's a similar account we're buying, because now you're back to, am I buying investors? Am I buying the frustrated sellers who are in a hurry to get out? And this is temporary management at best. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you want to elaborate on, just to put it out there, is inside of the Norfolk Accounting Standard, there's always ways to create new lines, like new charts, right? As far as you have a line here for Aquafina water that you want to separate in your business, you know, talk us through what you do there, just so everybody knows. Well, if you think more in terms of when you look at the accounting standards, you're going to see, for example, the 4100 series is all of your property management income. 4800 series is all of your brokerage or sales related income. And I this off the top of my head, but I think 4700 is maintenance. But inside of there, because you could also put a four digit number dot two more digits, you could put, you know, several thousand account numbers in there if that's what you wanted to do, but they're all going to summarize and subtotal up to that 4100, 4800, whatever. Same thing with your expenses. So when you have a 6200 series, that's a, the kind of advertising you're doing to bring in new landlords. Uh, and then there's other series related to your brokerage business or your maintenance business or whatever it might be. And you can add as many unique line items as you want in there and track what you're doing for that particular vendor, that particular expense. But at the same time, you can summarize because it's all going to subtotal automatically. I'm thinking QuickBooks, but all of these uh, whether it's Peachtree Accounting or whatever you're using, they all have the same functionality. So you've got the subtotal for all of that 6,200 series to look at, this is how much I spend to advertise for new landlords versus how much I spend to advertise to get more maintenance business. Inside the KPIs, let's, let's talk down and dirty in our businesses. I'm going to ask you this question I talked about in pre-show. Give me one of your key metrics and why. Now, you did mention the leasing stuff earlier, but do you have one that's like really one of your favorites that you created just for your business? You know, my, as the business owner, I think all of us, our favorite one is net income. But one of the ways that I have found that's uh, really key for us to generate a higher net income is I track the ratio of all payroll relative to gross income. So uh, some people think in terms of I need so many heartbeats or so many full-time equivalents per so many units. But that's not, not, in my mind, when you get bigger, not the best way to look at it because that can hire a lot of um, entry-level admins and have them implement the work of higher paid, more judgment capable property managers who are supervised by a much more capable uh, regional manager or director of property management who's supervised by a vice president. So if you get a, uh, a taller, narrower pyramid, then you can take a lot better advantage of your payroll numbers. And as long as the payroll is below a certain percent, then we find that we're very profitable. And when we have see that payroll climb, the profit dries up in correlation to that payroll increase. Are you uh, able to talk about that percent, like what your comfort level is there? Well, I could, but I can tell you that from talking to other companies, it kind of depends on your numbers. For instance, uh, when I say we don't play games, one of the, pro one of the common things that uh, entrepreneurs or self-employed folks will do is, well, I'm only getting a salary of say 36,000 a year. And so everything comes through as net income. So I don't have to pay social security and Medicare on that money. Well, if you get audited, you're going to get busted. I get a good six figure salary. So do my two VPs. Uh, so we're not playing that game. And my payroll numbers include everybody, including me and our vice presidents. And what we're looking at is when we have payroll that's over 60% of our property management gross, we're not doing as well. And when we have payroll less than 60%, we're doing really well. So that's kind of the number that I look at. Uh, I'm only going to say the name because many of the NARPM people know Eric Weatherington, who's currently the, um, the president of NARPM. His company has completely different numbers. But then the only reason that they're completely different is none of that higher level executive payroll is included in their numbers. And that's where it's back to, you need to look at your business. 
And that's where some of this is, uh, is unique. Having a standardized chart of accounts is going to mean that when you're surveyed and when we're surveyed, we're going to have metrics that we can apply to our own companies. But how you do your business is kind of your business. You might have maintenance, you might not. You might do sales, you might not. But you can figure out first what your normal is, then you can figure out what better than normal is. But none of that happens until you start measuring. Yeah, and I do think that you want to include your salaries inside of your business. So, you know, we look at that as well in our, in our staffing numbers. And it includes the business development staffing numbers. It includes my salaries. You know, just everything is thrown in there into the lump sum. And we get a similar type percentage ratio. We try to stay below 50%, but that's just our business. It doesn't mean we're better or worse or anything. One of the things I want to talk about too is, so this is my, one of my unique metrics that we created here. And it's just a snapshot of what's going on in the work order maintenance world. So we basically do a percent of work orders. So we take the total number of homes we manage divided by the open work orders that we have at any one point. And that turns out to be today, as of our meeting today, was 21%. And it's just a metric we made up. It means nothing other to, to nobody outside of here except us. But when we started it, you know, we were at 50%. So if, if, you got a, if you want to do some monkey math, let's say 800 homes for fun, you had 400 open work orders, right? 50%. Now we're down to like 21%, which means we're cycling through and closing the work orders faster. And when we started this created metric out of thin air, uh, they were like, what does this even mean? I'm like, well, you'll see what it means in six months or a year when we start to dwindle this down and you start to close these work orders instead of leaving them open for six months, right? And so really we saw the, the net effect of it again today and I just commented again today in our meeting, you know, a few months ago we were at 40% and now we went down to 30 and then today we're at 20, 21%. And uh, I, I'm just very proud of our team to be able to understand what that metric means. And so again, we just created out thin air and it means, only little if you care about maintenance, right? What some people will yeah. care about maintenance. Let me give you a different way to look at the same thing. Because you're looking at all work orders. And right. in your system, I don't know what software you got, but I haven't seen one yet that doesn't say you can't describe what kind of work order it is. For example, some are repair work orders, some are turnkey work orders, some are maintenance work orders, some are estimate work orders. You could create subcategories of work order types if you wanted to. For instance, uh, we just created several hundred work orders for fall HVAC service. Well, we created 700 or several hundred all at the same time. It's going to take a few weeks before all of them get done. Is that a bad reflection on our maintenance department? It is not, which is why we call that a recurring work order. So what we have done is we track how long it takes to do the different things. And uh, for instance, turnkey and repair. And the repair work order is in our sense, uh, our, our interpretation of measure of customer service. When the tenant asks for something, do we or do we not need to get the owner's authorization based on the dollar amount and our management agreement? And how quickly can we get it assigned to somebody? How quickly do we get it done? Because all the tenant cares about is I want it done and I want it done now. So the faster we close those repair work orders is a uh, indication of how well our customer service is doing related to the tenant. It's always got to go back to a meeting. Every single KPI has to have an end meeting and meaning, excuse me, to where it makes sense at the end of it. Otherwise, you're just tracking numbers to track numbers. I mean, if you don't understand and, what you mean. And that's how we bonus our maintenance coordinators. When they get below certain levels, they get bonuses. We have admins that uh, are in a call group to answer the phone. Digital phone system has a, a record of that. Our standard is answer the phone live 90% of the time during office hours. Usually they meet that. When they do, all of them get a bonus. But the whole issue there is if they don't all get it, nobody gets it. So everybody pitches in and doesn't think in terms of, well, I'm in the middle of something, somebody else will pick up that call. What I want to talk about now is let's talk about the fit, the feel, the, the end result of the add-on seminar that you're going to be putting on. So what are people, what are they going to expect? They walk in there, they sit down, are they going to be just showing spreadsheet after spreadsheet of boring stuff? I mean, what, what are they going to be expecting? Because, you know, by design, we're doing this Monday morning, right? So right. people can get there Sunday evening or they can fly in early Monday morning and they roll in with that accounting mindset of a hat on versus Wednesday afternoon at the final of three days of conference and a, a late night party the night before. Um, so we're doing this for intentional reasons on a Monday morning. So kind of talk us through what do you think they're going to experience and how it's going to feel for them when they attend your seminar? If they're numbers oriented and they want to increase their profit, then uh, what they're going to hear is why to do it. It's the intro, how to do it, 
and that's going to start broad and work its way down to the property management specific types of things. And then the encourage or the closing part is going to be more along the lines of, uh, so pick what you're going to start with. For those people that are not numbers oriented, um, it, like I talk about in the cash flow class, I've, I teach all of the NARPM, or I'm capable of teaching all of the NARPM designation classes, but my favorite one is the cash flow class because that's the one that's all about making money. Well, these KPIs are in one sense or another all about making money. So do it well, make more money. Uh, and for the, the smaller user, you might think that what we're presenting is somewhat overwhelming. One of the things that you get from this is uh, I have Excel templates that I use, and I've made those where they're going to be giveaways that you're offering with the registration for the class. So deliverable so, alert, deliverable alert, deliverable alert, everybody. <laughs> Mike is going to be giving out his... These, these three I different Excel templates. You paste in your data, and it automatically calculates a bunch of these things, and, then, uh, and now you can look and see what your numbers are. And, and I've got one place you've been asked for that. You've been asked for this a billion times online. I've seen you. I have. Uh, and so what I finally did for this class, when you bothered me about, uh, will you come out here and show us how to do that? I said, all right, if you'll stake me at a poker table for a couple of hours, no, just kidding. But, uh, if you'll, uh, uh, what I did is made them generic and, uh, made them a little bit easier for anybody to use rather than just, uh, Excalibur specific. And that way, when you get this, it's Excel, it's easy to customize, but it'll give you a really good template for how to start tracking what you want to track. You could ignore the stuff you don't need, but you might find like me that you grow into it over time. Because as you get bigger and more departmental, if you're the one that's out there leasing, you probably don't want to talk about how long days on market or your success is because it's just you. And if you're not doing a good job, you probably don't want to face that. But when you're using leasing agents, you need to know, number one, how cumulatively the company's doing, but you can also see it breaks it down per agent, per property manager, how their individual numbers are doing. And, uh, and you can see who deserves a reward and who doesn't. Uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, some of the things that we do. Our property managers get paid a base. And then there's several different things that, uh, that they can perform on. And if they're uh, green in any of these categories, they get extra money. If they're green all the way across the board, they get extra money and a paid day off. Uh, and it's been very effective, but they, they like the floor. They, they never make less than X, but they can also make more if their performance is good. And we're seeing the effort to make the performance. It's the difference between having a reactive property manager return phone calls and return emails versus a proactive property manager that's ahead of the game and taking care of things before they become a problem to fix. Who is this course for? Let's answer that question of, you know, the owners that's coming in, are they debating about bringing their potential staff members? Who is this course for? I mean, could you throw in the, the, the brand new property manager all the way up to the senior level executive? I mean, is this going to benefit pretty much anybody who attends? It's going to benefit anybody who, for whatever reason, needs to track performance. For example, the CEO, anybody that thinks like a CFO, but also any supervisor. Uh, when you see all of the different things that we track, if you break them down, I've got a maintenance department. Well, the maintenance supervisor has to track their own metrics. Now, we also track them to make sure our numbers match, to make sure that they're doing it correctly. But if you're gonna be a good supervisor, you've gotta be proactively on top of this stuff. Our marketing manager tracks their metrics. Our accounting manager tracks different metrics. The uh, property manager supervisor tracks different metrics. So uh, all of, and, and our brokerage operation tracks their own numbers. So all of those supervisors have to track their own numbers, which are backed up by us. And if there's a disconnect, meaning that there's a difference somewhere, we got to look at how are you counting versus us, but it helps them basically become better supervisors. While I'm tracking from a CEO perspective at the end of each month, how we did that previous month, they can use these same templates as they're going through the month to let people know, hey, we're behind here. We need to get this caught up. Hey, we're not doing so well here. We need to get, put some more effort on that so that they can work towards the bonus instead of being at the end of the month. Will we get it or will we not? They already know. They, they already know they hit their numbers because they were tracking how they're hitting their numbers. Yeah, I think the course is going to be designed for pretty much anybody that, that wants to understand the numbers better. And they don't have to be the full-blown supervisor, but I think a property manager, if they were to see this, they understand the business more as a whole. So I would argue that it could be almost anybody who has a decent financial mind or wants to even understand numbers better to have this as a deep level integration into at least a learning process. Now, 
let's talk deep level because this is, this is gonna be the 201 level. And so we wanna talk about the webinar that you're planning, we're planning to put on, which is more like the 101 introduction to the, the KPI development. And so that'll be announced in the next coming weeks, months. We'll probably wanna conduct that in January sometime. That way we can get everybody, maybe even February, so we get everybody kind of prepped, thinking about this stuff. And then they can, of course, if they miss the live one, they can go catch the recordings of it. And if they can listen and, and or get the recording prior to coming to the cash flow, excuse me, prior to coming to the uh, KPI add-on seminar at the Mastermind Conference, it gives them that 101 base. So talk us through kind of the, what you think the webinar will entail and how that ties into the add-on seminar. Well, we haven't coordinated exactly what we would cover, but one of the things that I would do is kind of uh, uh, at least give a glimpse or an example of the templates that we're talking about to see how these different things are meaningful to look at. Uh, that's part of the class. When we get to the part that's property management specific and we're measuring how do you track days on market and how do you track days vacant? Well, this is the how, but we're also going to cover the why. If you think about it, days vacant is dollars out of an owner's pocket. A quick example, some people that come out of multifamily, they talk about vacancy rate all the time. Well, if you had a hundred unit property that was in a college town and on July 30th, 10 of your tenants move out on July 31, you're 10% vacant. But on August 1st, all of those units are reoccupied. You only lost 10 days of rent, which is phenomenal performance from the investor's perspective. Well, if you're the property manager, regardless of whether the person was a frustrated seller or they bought it as an investment, they're an investor now, and it's all about money. And if you're able to demonstrate that you're going to reduce vacancy because of the way you uh, do certain things, renew leases, uh, how you lease the property, how you qualify your uh, applicants, et cetera. But you can demonstrate that because your numbers show you're only going to lose what, 26 days of vacancy every, uh, every tenancy. And our average tenant stay is four and a half years versus the, the apartment industry is more like 19 years with the REITs. It's more like uh, 34 months. So when you're doing a lot longer than that, then you're putting money in the owner's pocket. And if you can show them that, more owners are going to want to use your services. When what, they, what, what is your vacancy rate for fine? Ours, to lead this off, is right around 5 to 6%, depending on time of the year. And, and that's taking the total number of units we manage versus the homes that we have on the market vacant right now. So that's our vacancy rate. Now, there's a lot okay. of, I mean, this is the, this is, I've had this argument 100 times with people, is, you know, when is the unit vacant, right? That's always the, well, the unit's vacant when it's not collecting money. Okay. I get that. Um, that's very difficult to track in a certain case. Actually, uh, it's it, not. It is. I know you're right. You're, Mike, you're always right in numbers. I will never argue numbers <laughs> with you, my friend. You are always going to be right. We just make it really, really simple. And we, we call our vacancy rate as part of what the homes that are on the market vacant, which is all we have is vacant homes on the market versus our total number of homes under management. So that's how we at least track it internally. If it got to 15%, I would be having kittens and we'd be figuring something out. Right. But if we're, if we're at least consistently tracking the same bad metric over and over, at least we're consistently doing something on the good side. There is something to that. What we track is losses due to vacancy. And so we're tracking the number of days vacant every property suffers when there's a tenancy turnover. And our losses are below 3%. So um, it has to do with things like, we put an occupied home on the market 45 days before it's vacant and back to the KPIs, I'll give you that, that example. Uh, before we introduced this bonus plan, which we call a quick lease bonus, the uh, agent would say, why do I want to show this occupied property? The tenant's hard to get along with. They don't keep the place up very well. It's just kind of a pain. I'll just wait till it's empty and show it then. And so we didn't have as much success in, in renting occupied properties. Well, the agents get a commission every time they lease a property, but they get a bonus when they lease it quickly and what we call a second generation property, we're managing it. We've been managing as opposed to a first generation as a new sign up. So the first generation, we, we normally get those rent ready or we don't start this clock until it's rent ready. And if the leasing agent gets it uh, rented within the first 30 days, they get a bonus. If they get it uh, rented before the current tenant vacates, they get a bonus. Well, as soon as we introduce this bonus about uh, showing occupied properties, we now lease over 60% of our properties before the current tenant ever vacates, which reduces vacancy losses. You know, that, 
that way it's easier to schedule a turnkey, schedule a move in and have them in uh, 10 days to three weeks after the move out rather than just starting the process when the tenant vacates. And yeah, that, that's part of the uh, presentation I gave at the NARPM uh, national conference was retention equals growth. Well, that's a part of retention. You just retain that owner because if the owner has no time to like worry about a vacancy, they're less apt to sell, they're less apt to fire you. And that's, that's going to be retention big time on your numbers. So, and we could talk about this stuff all day long, but uh, I wanted to let people know that the next thing coming out on this thing is going to be the webinar. So you and I will put our heads together. We'll schedule a webinar. We'll probably see, you know, if we can do this in late December, early January and put that, that 101 version out there, whatever it might be. It might be just an hour long introduction just to give people some homework. So then they walk into this thinking, okay, I'm, I'm not starting with absolute, I'm not starting with crayon. You know, I'm, I'm really starting with a pen in my hand at that point. And so we're hoping to do some of that. What are your thoughts there? Well, except for a pen, bring a pencil with a big eraser. <laughs> Touche. But, uh, but yes, we, we can do that. And uh, I think at a minimum, we can cover those uh, metrics that any business owner ought to cover. And that way they can do a little homework looking at their own QuickBooks and trying to figure out what their own margins are, things of that nature. And that's back to where the NARPM accounting standards is going to be a real boon is initially we need to adopt it. And then next year or whenever we get the first survey out, when people that are on that accounting standard are uh, confidentially, nobody knows who submitted this, uh, submitting their information, then it's going to be pooled by folks who are not uh, competitors of yours. And then we'll get numbers back and we'll be able to see. For example, uh, one of the things that Daniel Craig and his presentation we're talking about that at the highest level there are companies that are generating a 25 percent net margin well i know enough about that those are also when i say smaller companies they're companies that gross you know three to five hundred thousand dollars a year versus companies that are grossing five and ten million dollars a year are not generating 25 percent margins and as I you grow be, but then again having having 25 percent of five hundred thousand dollars is not near as much as having ten percent of five million dollars got you there. But I want to bring this in before I forget. You mentioned Daniel Craig and they were the basically the the vendor profit coach is the you know Daniel Craig is part of that vendorship profit coach and they were the ones that created the NARPM accounting standard. So you and I were on the committee just to patch the crazy idea and then they were the actual ones to create those charter accounts and get it you know approved through a bunch of different CPA levels. What I forgot to mention is Daniel Craig is going to be on site for the add-on seminar with you and he'll be kind of floating around the room. He might have, you know, we might give him five, 10 minutes of the floor time just to kind of say hello. But, you know, he's going to be there to assist people uh, in those one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and kind of just being around that room. And, and uh, I think he's going to be a very good resource. He is an absolute genius on what he's doing. And I, I think we want him to be around that area with us when we do that add-on seminar. He's not taking your floor, but he's definitely going to be around to, to give five, 10 minutes of uh, saying hello and, you know, add something to it. All right. You're excited about that, I know. Less time you got to talk, right? More well, time. Be, it would be a good like handoff if it turns out that there's uh, 50 people in the room and five of them are going, "This is kind of over my head." Well, there's Daniel right there. He can do it for you. Mm -hmm. And then once it's set up, all you're doing is looking at the numbers. And bigger net income is better than smaller net income. That's pretty simple. And as we're talking through this, and this is horrible to be talking through this now, but why not? Is I think we may want to set up this webinar in December. You know, I think we could do it then so we can tell people, hey, don't forget to set up your NARPM accounting standards starting 1st of January. So you can come in with potentially clean books that we can look at it at the add-on seminar and you can work with Daniel and you can work with Mike and, and kind of get an idea of where you are. So I think that's a, now that we're thinking through that process, maybe December could be a better deal. That's fine. Uh, and I'm all for, I don't know about you, but uh, typically we slow down a little bit in the November through February timeframe. So this is the time of year to do projects anyway. But if you are using, we're on QuickBooks, and so I can speak from experience that if you're on QuickBooks, you've got many years worth of data and you don't want to lose it, you can modify your chart of accounts. You don't have to worry about starting from scratch. It'll just take a little longer to do the modification, but it works just fine. If you don't, uh, if you don't know how to do that, then either Daniel Craig or a lot of other CPAs can, or, or other QuickBooks advisors can help you with that. But uh, it just, when you do that, all the things that were tracked under that account number are now tracked under the new account number, but it's the same information. So now you can go back historically and look at what your 6200 series and your 4100 series were in the previous three or four years. 
and I've heard anywhere to do this between 500 bucks to 1500 bucks, somewhere in there, depending on your CPA, the vendor you hire. So we're not talking a 10 grand, 20 grand investment. We're talking a few hundred bucks, but in the long run, it's going to way more benefit you than whatever little expense you spend up front. And so, so next steps, you and I, we're going to be scheduling this webinar, the one-on-one KPI development webinar. And that should be coming out here in the next week or so. We'll get together, put our heads together, uh, try to schedule this for the mid to late December sometime. I love that time frame as I was telling my team today in the staff meeting. Here we are in November. It's the bottom. This is the bottom of our cycle where it hits bottom the end of November, right after Thanksgiving, and then December starts to ramp up. And it really just never stops until, you know, almost late summer next year. That's just how the market we're in. Some markets are in that bell curve market where they don't do anything until April and then they shut off in the, you know, the end of August, right? It's like a big, right. big bell curve. We're more of a flat line. We're getting military city, USA, people moving in, moving out all the time. And so we have a lot of that consistency, which is cool. All right, next steps from here, Mike, I want to thank you for being on the Property Manager Mastermind podcast. Look forward to having you at the add-on seminar number one at the Property Manager Mastermind conference, March of 2020. Visit pmmcon.com to learn more. Any parting words for the crew out there? I uh, look forward to seeing you in Las Vegas and uh, make sure to save your money once you get there and invest it wisely by uh, coming away with some great ideas to go home and implement and generate more net income. Appreciate it. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon, Mike. All right. Slumber.